Watching She-Hulk is as big a risk to your brain as a night with Jeffrey Dahmer. I told you. We're gonna hang out. And watch a movie. And take some pictures. Actually, come to think of it, I'd rather take my chances with that guy. At least he's interesting. I can try something really fun. I reviewed episode one of this Drek a couple months ago and swore up and down that it was the only video I'd be doing for this abomination. There were clear issues in the writing and the messaging in the very first episode that told me there were fundamental flaws that wouldn't and couldn't be improved upon as the series went on, so I was happy to write it off. But after nearly two months of hearing how terrible it had gotten, I sat and binged eight straight episodes of She, Her, Hulk. It was on the level of an alcoholic relapse, enough booze to put the critical drinker to shame. Nah, it'll be fine. And after a trip to the ER, some saline, and a blood transfusion, I returned to make my report. What did I come away with for an opinion? It's shit. It is a table of shit. To wit, this show is quite possibly the worst television program I've ever watched in my fucking life. It's demeaning, regressive, and has on-the-nose messaging completely missing its target audience in favor of trying to pander to people who aren't even watching the show. It's hard to even know where to begin when discussing what's wrong with this series because issues are plentiful and awfulness abound. Whether it's the writing, pacing, character presentation, the special effects, or meta-commentary, there's not a single redeeming quality about this absolute pile of dog shit. Strap on and strap in because I'm not just reviewing each episode, I got some shit to say first. I'm not just going over the individual episodes. First, let's break down the show's messaging and commentary, and near the end, attempt to fix the writing of this piece of shit. Every problem I brought up in my first She-Hulk review unsurprisingly carried over to the remaining episodes. In reality, I could have just released that video as a wrap-up to the show and nothing would have been different. The She-Hulk CGI looks like fucking Gumby walking around. It's astoundingly embarrassing and I feel horrible for the special effects artists forced to work on this bullshit. The pacing and overall writing of this show is a bigger travesty than the Rings of Power, and, uh, that's saying something. Emphasizing the fact that it's She-Hulk attorney at law right in the title, you'd think the show would have at least some sort of grasp on the legal system. But the fact that the writers of the show admitted to not being able to do courtroom drama, or even understand basic fundamentals of the law, is not only glaringly obvious, it gets worse as the show progresses. It lets us know the studio took a look and said, it's the purest form of the now iconic line from Red Letter Media. Don't ask questions. Just consume product and then get excited for next product. The writing style is the tried and true. If we point out how dumb the story, plot, or situation is, the audience will interpret it as clever. Also known as uncreative bullshit. Each episode jumps from boring, shallow situation to boring, shallow situation, barely stretching a bland scenario to 20 minutes each time. On one particular occasion, the show even goes so far as to unironically glad-hand itself for using basic writing techniques. Connecting the A and B story? Nice. <laughs> as if to point out its own cleverness, completely ignoring the fact it doesn't even have an overarching storyline. But I'll get to that. Because where to really start breaking things down? How about first, the messaging? When I decided to review this show, I convinced my girlfriend to watch each episode with me so I could get a female perspective. She's a wonderful woman who has her master's degree in counseling psychology and is starting her doctorate program in counseling. She's currently a school counselor, and yeah, her dipshit boyfriend reviews movies and draws and writes comic books for a living. So we make for an odd but awesome pair. She isn't hyper aware of the cultural discussion of agendas being shoehorned into everyday media by choice, AKA, she's not a dumbass like myself who literally makes a living talking about it. So her agreeing to watch the show and give her own feedback not only allowed for a female perspective, but a perspective of someone outside the entertainment sphere. What's fascinating is her conclusions were very similar to mine, and I'll go into detail as they come up when discussing each episode, but one conclusion we both agreed on, its messaging is not only regressive, but damaging. This show epitomizes everything that modern popular culture creators like to steer into. Identity politics, pick your oppressed person empowerment messaging, and the constant and incessant need to promote an agenda over a good story, while simultaneously using that agenda as a shield against any legitimate criticism whatsoever. What is unignorable and inescapable when it comes to she, her Hulk, is the identity politics that not only plays up but shoves directly into your face like sandpaper. She-Hulk isn't just a female empowerment show, it's a boss bitch show starring the most giga boss bitch ever digitized. Do I want to talk about this? 
Absolutely fucking not. But it's what the show is about. There's no way around discussing it, whether it's straight from the marketing itself or from life-sucking shills, the estrogen is strong with this one. I think what's the most despicable and simultaneously the most fascinating aspect of this show is its proper application of gaslighting when it comes to its audience. What do you mean by that, Cynic? Well, let me break it down. In no uncertain terms, the show simplifies and breaks down every male character into a stereotypical buffoon, asshole, chauvinistic pig, or a combination of all three, while propping up its female characters whose self-delusion makes them think, and as the writers hope, makes the audience think that they have no discernible flaws or shortcomings whatsoever. Despite the fact that our lead is narcissistic, vapid, and devoid of any charisma or real personality, besides the daily struggles of being a rich, middle-aged, wine-drinking Californian female, whose only personality traits are dripped in vanity, booze, and trying to one-up and fret over every man she comes into contact with, all the while trying to figure out why she's single. It's not some thematic undertone, it's literally what the entire show's about. I mean, fuck, the main antagonist of the show is men in general, but we'll get to that on the nose idiocy later. And as mentioned, it's written all over the marketing for the show, too. Conveniently, though, the showrunners and creators use any criticism of the show whatsoever to attack its own fan base in the real world, just as it does with its own meta commentary. You don't think the show's funny? Wow, you must be fun at parties, you fucking misogynist. Fucking misogynist. It's circular logic that trumps any and all criticism, a perfect shield using a catch-all term to block, ignore, deflect, or invalidate any legitimate criticism whatsoever. It's on-the-nose meta-commentary if talked about positively makes you a great person, but if you have a dissenting opinion, you only think negatively about it because you hate women. A perfect example of this idiotic style of defense in action happened to Moist Critical, who's one of the best voices on YouTube. The guy is typically right down the middle, and he discusses social and cultural topics but is as level-headed as it gets. When he dared to even touch on the new Velma TV show with a simple question of why are they attacking their own audience, he was pounced on immediately. Man, this screams like a show made by people that hate the audience that they're borrowing the IP from. What, what is the point? Like, why not just make your own original one? Why immediately antagonize people who just want Scooby-Doo? Why, why is everyone who works in the industry so angry all the time? Why do you just keep saying white guy take? What? Is that bait or a joke? The, the literal opening line to this is just immediately shitting on legitimately everyone that would have cared about Scooby-Doo. It's meta in the worst way. What's the point? You made a show that immediately shits on people that like the property. Why? Why use the property then just make your own? Why do you think, are you, are you, are you being serious? I can't, who is in this chat right now? Why do you think caring about Scooby-Doo entails keeping a character white then? I haven't said anything about her skin color. This is the most Twitter shit of all time. Charlie, aka Moist Critical, is someone I would consider outside the sphere of culture wars. So as a regular Joe, taking a look at something and questioning in such a manner, it speaks to the fact that there's something seriously wrong in the way modern films and TV shows are being written and marketed. You can't even attempt to critique anything in modern culture without having vitriol hurled at you like this. It's gaslighting at its finest. We're having true feminist representation. A bunch of other movies have done it better. Why aren't you? Why does it matter what we do? It's not even for you. Ratings are plummeting. Why isn't anyone watching our show? This photo's been circling around the internet for a couple weeks now, and it still makes me laugh every time I see it. These people live in a fucking bubble and somehow think the world revolves around them. It's incredible. Now, I know the name of this channel is Movie Cynic, but I'll clue you. As of this writing, I previously published 24 videos, 17 of which are reviews of a movie or TV show. The others are video essays or general commentary, and of the 17 reviews, 9 are positive, with more than half of those, 5 out of 9, starring a woman. This year alone, the film Everything Everywhere All at Once is simply one of the best movies I've ever seen. Social messaging in and of itself isn't bad. Far from it. As always, it's completely in the execution whether it's good or bad. I understand the show is supposed to be a comedy, a more light-hearted affair, and that's all well and good. But it doesn't excuse it from being written so fucking lazily. Shows that are light-hearted or meant to be comedic are allowed to also have heart, characters you give a shit about, and messages that hit home. 
Just because I'm not a woman doesn't mean I can't connect or understand or empathize with a woman's difficult situation. Just because your skin is a certain pigmentation doesn't mean you can't connect and identify with another person's plight. There's an underlying human element that connects us all. Themes and personal stories that we can all relate to. It's when a movie, show, or book shines a light on the humanity we all relate to that storytelling is at its absolute best. Something that everything everywhere all at once does. That Felicity Jones' character Jin Erso in Rogue One has in that film's best moments. The ability to make a psychopath somehow relatable and even manage to extract sympathy from the audience that the absolutely brilliant Mia Goth gets out of us in the film Pearl. And no, it doesn't have to be an Oscar bait style film or an Emmy seeking TV show to do that. So no, social messaging isn't bad. What is bad is the backward thinking, regressive, on the nose commentary that belittles and denigrates in order to prop up a plight. She-Hulk is the worst defender of this I've ever seen on screen and it doesn't just insult its primary audience, it clumsily, stupidly, and inadvertently regresses the feminist agenda. It's a fucking joke, but we're most certainly not laughing with it. Alright, let's move the fuck on, shall we? This topic obviously won't be going away since it's literally the essence of the show, but let's get to reviewing. The last video fully dissected the problems with episode 1, but as mentioned, those problems persisted. And the plot of each episode is pretty fucking generic and to the point, so this won't take nearly as long. She-Hulk, episode 2. This one starts off with Jen being fired from her firm because of the we need to reveal Jen as She-Hulk to the masses plot device of the previous episode. Then she immediately gets hired by another firm to represent the abomination in an attempt to tie up a loose end from the 2008 Incredible Hulk movie. And that's it. That's the fucking episode. And then storytelling at its finest here, I sat there wondering, is there any particular reason they'd let Abomination have parole? They go over how dangerous it is to even get close to him. Do not touch the glass separating you and the prisoner Abomination. Do you accept these conditions? Yes. Sign here. In the event of injury or death, please indicate who we should notify. It's that bad, huh? Then I remembered, oh yeah, it's what the writers want to happen, so fuck logic. Just do it. Go, I'm a completely different person now. Literally. <sighs> ah yes, addressing the actor change from Edward Norton to Mark Ruffalo. You know, this didn't work in Iron Man 2. Look, it's me. I'm here. Deal with it. Let's I, move on. I, I just I drop, drop it. it. All right. And it doesn't work here either. Hey, here's a character that must represent most men to the writers. Take a lap, Dennis. There's a hot chick over there. I'm gonna go talk to it. Him Hulk episode three. In this absolute banger of an episode, Jen convinces the parole board to let Blonsky out on parole. Oh, and this is the classic episode where she Hulk twerks. I know you can't wait to see Wong. I get it. Uh, I just want to make sure that you don't think this is one of those cameo every week type of shows. That's not. Just remember whose show this actually is. Wow, it's almost as if the showrunners knew they had a complete disaster on their hands and decided to shoehorn in as many cameos as possible to try and entice people to watch it. Way to acknowledge the fact that you have a bland, annoying protagonist that can't draw an audience on her own. At least I can compliment you for that. The whole band hold away. But then they gave it to a woman? Yeah, man. Sound good. Why are you doing everything for females? So we have a meet too. Have you seen this insanity? I don't care what anybody says about me. Continuing the meta jokes, Jen points out the backlash they knew they'd get. As if pointing out the inherent flaw in the show's concept somehow makes it no longer a flaw. Brilliant. It's almost as if the writers live in such a weird bubble that it didn't even pass through their minds they could possibly create something bad. The only possible reason for such villainous criticism? Misogyny. 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 Also in the superhuman law division. Yeah. No, I can't talk to a 10 about embarrassing man stuff. She could be my next fiance. You've seriously got to be fucking kidding me. This show infantilizes women and gaslights men. This is a pretty solid example of what I meant when I said the show is regressive in every respect. It straightforwardly criticizes criticism of the show, while also mocking the primary audience for comic book projects. Males. At this point, my girlfriend paused the episode and commented, It feels like the only way they think they can portray a strong woman is if they make the man incompetent. Tim Roth is essentially phoning in his performance as the Abomination, whose character is in this show because of his connection to the Hulk. Unfortunately for the lazy-ass writers, Abomination was last seen in Shang-Chi duking it out in underbelly fights. So how do the writers get around this when they want Jen to fucking represent him for a parole hearing? Well, 
They simply parade Wong in to explain that it wasn't Blonsky himself that left. Wong actually removed him from prison. Why did he do it? Who the fuck knows, because instead of coming up with a logical reason why, Wong begins his explanation. Have you ever heard of a comité? Mm-mm. Mm. I'd like to move for dismissal of all charges against my client. Uh then they cut away to something else. Then cut back after Wong's wrapped it up already. In regard to Mr. Blonsky vacating his cell, I gave him no choice. But it was absolutely his choice to return. It's the equivalent of that scene from Thank You for Smoking, when Aaron Eckhart's character asks how people could be smoking cigarettes in a spaceship without it blowing up. Sony has a futuristic sci-fi movie they're looking to make. The cigarettes in space. It's the final frontier, Nick. But wouldn't they blow up in an all-oxygen environment? Probably. It's an easy fix. One line of dialogue. Thank God we invented the, you know, whatever device. Now we get to everyone's favorite iconic She-Hulk scene, the one that will live in infamy, the twerking. And if I hear Megan the Stallion one more time, I might off myself, although that might come off as a win to activists everywhere. She, her, she, her, episode, 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 episode. In this episode, Jen represents Wong in an inconsequential cease and desist case, and then she goes on a date. Then the episode's over. I have a legal situation of the greatest importance. After Wong admitted to breaking Abomination out of prison, shouldn't he be a wanted criminal? You realize that you've just admitted to facilitating a prisoner escape, which is a crime. I must have run. As a lawyer, Jen should know this, right? It's going to have bearing on the story, right? Eh, fuck it. That's not what we need to happen in the story. Move along. Stop, Stop taking, taking things so serious. So serious. So serious. Excuse me, ladies. I hate to see two stunning women sitting all alone. Can I buy you sexy ladies round of drinks? Okay, sir, we're clearly in the middle of work here. When you change your mind, I'll be at the bar. My girlfriend then sighed and rolled her eyes again at this. I turned and asked her why, and she explained it thusly. All these things that are happening to Jen and her friends in the show do happen to women. But there's a caveat to that, she said. Not every man acts this way, yet every single interaction Jen has with a man in the show has portrayed them as weak, incompetent, or the guy's a complete pig. As if all these things somehow exist in a vacuum, like Jen only runs into every horrible misogynistic stereotype imaginable, and only that kind of person. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm an entrepreneur. Oh, in what field? TBD. We should do this again. There's an idea. <laughs> this is Alan. Yeah, she's like a six. God, you're just so powerful. What a specimen. Did you just call me a specimen? As a compliment. Just did 600. I'm not even a superhero. Hey, can somebody take our order? Okay. Oh, no. Do you remember that date I went on with the guy, uh, the fetish? I know her. Uh, of course you do. Yeah. Was creepy and disgusting. Oh my, you mean specifically putting yourself out there as She-Hulk attracted people who are attracted to She-Hulk? How fucking bizarre. I get fucking pissed when I get what I want too, Jen. I feel you. Even Pug, the one decent guy in the show, somehow oddly gets thrown into the mix too, as if the writers couldn't find another way to air out their grievance. I love harassing women in the workplace. It's my kick, baby. Not cool! I don't. You guys know me. It's this oddly mean-spirited, bubble-living therapy session for the writers. Like they're using Jen as a stand-in for every microaggression they've ever faced and are just constantly fucking put upon. Who are you? Uh, Jen. Just not in Hulk form. Just Jen. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, I'm gonna go. Uh, and uh, don't worry about the sweater. Even the one nice guy who Jen emasculates then gets upset because she hates that he didn't like getting catfished by her, has the writers awkwardly trying to manipulate the audience into feeling bad for Jen for fucking lying to the guy and him not liking it. She, they, Hulk, episode five. But yeah, anyway, so Titania trademarked the name She Hulk, which Jen didn't think to do because she's terrible at her job. And uh, Jen gets a new costume. <laughs> what a special episode. One of her previous dates is even a client of her firm, which means she encounters another farcical, misogynistic situation. We should, um, yeah, we should reconnect soon. Okay. 
as is now the standard, our protagonist sits around with a friend and complains about men. Holloway could never have gone through that. He's never had to prove his value to a parade of underwhelming men. <laughs> oh, the narcissistic personality this character has is surely realistic. There are surely people like this. But it's also disgusting to have it in a main character that the writers want you to like. Jen, having no redeeming qualities whatsoever, once again appears to be a stand-in for the writer's grievances in a make-believe therapy session for despicable people written as a scene in a TV show. It's as if Jen is sitting there suggesting that her constant drinking, work-obsessed yet not actually good at her job, put-upon lifestyle is already good enough, and that someone needs to meet her undefinable standards to be her partner, and how dare they not already be here in front of her. Surely Jen doesn't need to do anything to be a desirable partner for anyone. She's already fantastic. Think about everything that She-Hulk brings to the table, and those guys were my best option. See? What a perfect way to reinforce the narcissism in their desired audience of 30-something single wine drinkers seeking a partner without any introspection as to why they don't have one. Reinforcing their narcissism and setting a great example for young girls and young women who, as we discussed over the twerking scene, is clearly one of the few folks actually watching this drek. They Them Hulk, Episode 6. The intelligence of this episode gives Stephen Hawking a run for his money. This time, we get a filler episode where Jen goes to a wedding. Exciting! In a TV show where one-third of its runtime is a recap of the previous episode and end credits, and the show is somehow shortened to nine episodes from 12, they still manage to need a filler. Incredible. I'm immortal, so I can't die. I'm sorry, and, and, you, and you think that this woman who has a law degree doesn't know what immortal means? Nikki. Well, how funny is it that you have to point out she's a woman with a law degree, as if either of those things have any bearing on her knowing what a fucking word means that has A, nothing to do with her gender, and B, nothing to do with her area of expertise? Lawyers were supposed to not be judgmental. No, they're just, they just have to represent you. I'm obviously I'm out. ending I'm a relationship. That is so hard. messed up. After any of the answers which I did. Christ, I'd off myself too in this situation. My friend sent me a link to a video posted on that site, Intelligentsia. The one for hateful man babies? Yep, that's the one. Ah yes, the thing for hateful man babies. I'm surprised they didn't use words like toxic, problematic, or some ist or ism thrown in for good measure. Oh, she was 30. Ew. Oh, okay. I just copy and pasted what a bunch of guys have actually said to me on the internet. Mr. Immortal is once again another man in the show who's a complete piece of shit, because obviously. Oh. This is... what? What is this? Mal, how do we kill She-Hulk? This is dark. Now it gets even deeper. All men are... Insults. Apparently. There is a nice guy in this episode who fawns over Jen after speaking at least six whole sentences to her. She, of course, swoons over him because he speaks to her inner narcissist by telling her she's great despite volleying a total of two entire topics with her. Oh, wait a minute. He's actually a bad guy. Well, obviously, he's a man. She, Her, Hulk, Episode 7. Can you believe yet that I binged this fucking show? I did this for you. Remember that. Three episodes to go. Let's get to it. In this episode, Jen realizes she's a piece of shit. Then it doesn't matter because she acts the same anyway. The end. Are you going down a rabbit hole on that intelligentsia site? What? No, I don't care what a bunch of losers say about me online. Maybe you don't, but the writers really, really do. The desperation of this character makes me want to vomit. Sorry I'm late. I, I lost track of time in the yurt. No way. Whew. That guy's here? You probably don't even remember who he is. Tell me they previously on him. No, I don't care. We're doing it again. Um, previously on this guy. Yeah, we're back it up. <laughs> this speaks so much about the writing of this show. Maybe they're not talentless hacks, and this was done at the last minute. Yet another, if we point out the stupid, it's no longer stupid, wishful thinking style of writing. At this point, it's beyond pathetic. Gumby Hulk, episode 8. Fuck, here it is, the Daredevil episode. The one they've tried to hook people with, because like we discussed, She-Hulk isn't an actual draw. Unfortunately for them, it's a dude who's the draw. The very nature of Mr. Jacobson's line of work, making suits exclusively for superheroes, necessitates anonymity. May I remind you that the Sokovia Accords have been repealed. 
So something that rocked the foundations of the MCU and set up Thanos' victory in Infinity War, since Tony and Cap were split apart, is addressed and dismissed with a single line of throwaway dialogue. Ouch. Stealth's the way to go, okay? Trust me, I've done this a million times. Just remind me again how many times you've broken into a warehouse full of goods. Daredevil says to use stealth and then promptly doesn't use stealth at all. What I can say, at the least, is they didn't make him an incompetent fool. Which is surprising, since the MCU appears to not have any problem so far tearing down or sidelining their far more popular characters in order to make their shitty B-list heroes look better. He outwitted Jen in every way, both in the courtroom and when superheroing. Interestingly though, the walk of shame they made him do does bring him down a peg because they can't let him get away without humiliating him in some way. What's it like being a female lawyer? So special and empowering. I love it. Twice the work, half the recognition, and you're constantly being asked what it's like being a female lawyer. The fact that the line, we get half the recognition, was uttered during the same year the most famous and lauded lawyer was a woman, Miss Camille Vasquez, who represented Johnny Depp in the greatest setback for the Me Too movement since its inception, is hilarious to me. <laughs> this is the truth presented by Intelligentsia. She-Hulk does not deserve your attention. She does not deserve your praise. Can we stop this? And she's a slut. Basically, anyone who dares criticize the show is the enemy. It's really fascinating stuff. She Shrek, episode 9. Make any sense. Is this working for you? Hey. What kind of stupid finale is this? Uh, we thought it'd be really cool and like unexpected. Yeah, like fun and kind of a kind of a twist. A twist? Yeah. The, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is known for its big spectacles and high stakes plot lines. When I was learning to be both Jen and She-Hulk, those are my stakes, Kevin. I have someone here that I'd like you all to meet. This is my son, Scar. <gasps> the level of meta in this episode is so out of sync with what they've done in all previous eight. It was just so jarring. Just in general, if you were going for fourth wall breaks, like, this is just so out of left field. It, yeah. It's not compatible with anything they've done before. Yeah, I, I don't know where it came is from. Yeah. Easily the worst out of all nine. This is the best episode of all because the show is fucking over. The show concludes and absolutely won't be picked up for a second season. The end. Fuck it. Okay, so now that we've reviewed every fucking episode, let's try and fix this steaming pile of shit. The first thing I'd do is never greenlight this show to begin with, but since that's not the point of this exercise, what is a basic thing we could do to fix this abomination? Well, for starters, we could give Jen a character arc. Wouldn't that be something? And if we were to do that, how would we do it? Let's stick with the idea that the writers wanted Jen to be an unlikable character. Characters with shitty personality traits are usually the best, but we typically call them villains or antagonists. Our hero or protagonist or as Mr. Plinkett calls it, can have asshole traits too, but since they're our hero and main focus, it would be wise to give them at least some redeeming personality trait, or something that tells us they're going to find redemption or better themselves as the story progresses. You have to give the audience a reason to root for your hero. Since this is a comedy, let's take a look at Michael Scott from The Office. What a fucking disaster of a character he is. And as a protagonist and our main character, he's written masterfully. He's constantly fucking up, saying horrible shit or doing the wrong thing. Oh god. Busy work. Oh, get away, Cretan. Um, but you need to have him signed by then or much earlier. Chillax, Pam. Stop Pam messing. Like that uh, dwarf from Lord of the Rings. Gimli. Nerd. That is why you're not on the team. Just trying to but the show is smart enough to make us feel bad for Michael when it's right, or finds the right moments to remind us that he has a good heart, that he generally means well, and really loves his employees and friends. Pam Caso, 
Sorry I'm late, I had to race across town. You did these freehand? Yep. Look at this one. Wow. You nailed it. How much? What do you mean? I don't see a uh, price. You want to buy it? Well, yeah. I'm really proud of you. As far as Jen goes on the show, she's simply a narcissistic alcoholic with, let's face it, zero redeeming qualities. There's absolutely nothing about Jen that any reasonable audience member would like other than the fact that she's the main character, so we're supposed to. Giving her any sort of positive character trait to remind us of her humanity is necessary, regardless of whether or not this is meant to be a lighthearted comedy show. Second, the narrative of this fucking thing is all over the place. There's no overarching story. Instead, it bounces from scenario to scenario, each episode representing a new fluff court case and situation for Jen to be in for 20 minutes of screen time. I still find it hilarious that the show patted itself on the back for its writing. Connecting the A and B story? Nice. <laughs> what would correct this is having an overarching storyline, something that plays throughout the series up to the finale. What would have worked best was having the Emil Blonsky abomination case be that storyline, since one, it's a show about a lawyer and the law, and two, he's the most interesting case she had because of her personal connection to him and despite the fact that Tim Roth is not giving a fuck. Imagine intertwining Jen's personal character arc with the overarching storyline of Abomination's parole case. Perhaps Jen is narcissistic and is representing who she considers a villain, but seeing his change helps her along the way realize her own personality flaws and makes her want to improve. They mildly attempt that in passive fashion, with him popping up in all of two episodes before it regresses the character back to her shitty status quo. And this is easily something they could have done, and done well. Then again, I guess you actually need to hire someone who knows anything about the law to write an intriguing court case. You could even go another route, where Jen's paralegal could be her voice of reason. A great example of this is the film A Few Good Men, starring Tom Cruise and Demi Moore. Tom Cruise plays the hotshot young lawyer who's never seen the inside of a courtroom, and Demi convinces him to take on a high-profile case that could possibly put his career in the shitter if he pursues the truth. Ultimately, Demi Moore's character helps push Cruise, becoming wiser, more mature, and essentially help him get his head out of his ass and actually kicking ass instead. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! I did the job! Did you order the code red? You're goddamn right I did! Superhero films get a free pass to sample other genres, and even other films. So there's no reason they couldn't have taken a cue from that movie. They could have had a male paralegal play second fiddle to Jen. You know, possibly a male character who wasn't a fucking idiot. But hell, we know that isn't possible for this show, so you could still have her female paralegal be that voice of reason for her. It would give her a character arc, real progress, and we might actually like her. As far as the comedy goes, I don't know what to fucking tell you there. This show is about as funny as a colonoscopy, and the best I can do is tell you, maybe hire a writer who's actually fucking funny. All in all, She-Hulk is by far the worst television show I've ever seen in my life. It's a vain, sloppy therapy session for the writers using its characters to represent whatever wrongs they felt they dealt with in their lives. It's a show that has a target audience who doesn't actually watch it, nestled in a universe beloved by people the writers absolutely despise. I don't know how this pile of shit was greenlit, but here it is, in all its unholy anti-glory. In the end, no lessons will be learned here, the writers will most likely get an even bigger gig, and then complain that they work twice as hard and get paid half as much, and no one will be better for any of this. But like the actress who plays Titania said, at least I got paid. GG's!